I'm, I'm going in, Mona. I'm starting recording because otherwise we're just going to talk and then be too tired. Yeah. Yeah, we can do a fake hello if you want, but the truth is we've been talking for a little while already. Talking for a little while. Um, but I just want to say for people who are just now seeing this, I want to kind of like brag a little bit on you. Is that okay? About like what? Sure. Oh, yeah. Okay, great. Um, so everyone who's jumping in, I've been talking. Mona and I are friends. This is Mona Shalabi. We've uh, known each other for, I guess, about a couple years. We met in New York City. And um, I'm like one like the, the most massive fan of Mona. Mona is a data journalist and writer. Um, and I'm just gonna get to give kind of listeners an idea, like, cause you and I will just like start riffing. Oh, really? but, yeah. <laughs> um, but Mona is a writer and her work has appeared in the New Yorker, the New York Times, New York Review of Books, also an illustrator. Um, and that work has been commended by the Royal Statistical Society work has ended up in the Design Museum, the House of Illustration, and Mona's also a producer and presenter and did a project, the Emmy-nominated video series, Vagina Dispatches, and then also did this really cool audio experiment that I love. Oh my god, listen to it. <laughs> 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 um, but uh, the reason I asked Mona and the reason I just kind of have such admiration for you, Mona, is in your translational leadership, right? Like you translate in data complicated numbers into um, information that people can actually use. And one of the things that Mona and I were just talking about, we're just, um, well, we're talking about domestic violence, uh, <laughs> um, but we were also, yeah, you know, we just kind of dove right in. Um, but we were also talking about uh, toxic masculinity, what it means to be a, a queer body and um, it'd be experiencing anger in relationship to uh, personal experiences of domestic violence and how the conversations that we as queer trans guys have been having around toxic masculinity and being particularly kind of uniquely positioned to be able to unpack that a little bit. So Mona was basically asking me a bunch of questions, even though I, I was. Had a bunch of questions for her. Um, I was going to ask you, aside from the conversations that you're kind of like having within your own community, as you said, how do you see yourself represented at the moment in the more public trans conversations about about trans and gender non-conforming people? Because it feels like um, there's been a very justified focus on Black trans either black trans women or black trans femme, femme people or people who are black and uh, gender non-conforming. I would say maybe less so with trans men right now. And then there's also this really interesting, obviously I'm in the UK where TERFs are having just a field day over there and it's so prevalent. And, it, and what's interesting there is the conversation is all about women. It's not about trans men. But in the background of all of this is actually the trans man is the bogeyman, right? Like that's the threat. That's the, that's the person that's going to come into the bathroom. That's the person who's going to like, you know, so I'm just interested given all of those things, do you see yourself represented in those conversations? What's missing? What's not? Yeah. Big question. I'm sorry. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, I think, and this relates, I think to your work similarly is it's like, whenever really important conversations are happening and I think that it's so vital that we understand the um you know the the at-risk category that trans folks particularly trans women of color are they are excluded from society they have very little uh federal and state protections the ones that they have are constantly being um, eroded. And the truth is, is that statistically, they are the most susceptible to violence on the body. And so that the conversation is about trans women, black women, brown women, Latinx trans women, who are women. Um, mm -hmm. I think it's always important when we have the opportunity to say that, to say it. Um, this, the statistics are that they bear the, the violence of, um, 
they bear the brunt of the violence on their bodies, on their actual bodies. And so do I feel excluded from that conversation? No, because we're talking about my sisters mm -hmm. and, and the ones that raised me up. Um, yeah. And I think that, that the, the, the difficulty that I have sometimes when conversations are happening in the United States, and maybe you have this too, is, you know, I feel like complicated conversations in the United States very quickly become diluted into who's right, who's wrong, um, into very simplistic terms. And even though intersectional theory is born out mm -hmm. of black feminism, um, there is an overarching, which I guess explains why there is an overarching reluctance to, in public discourse, hold the points at which all of these things nuance. Yeah. Intersect. And as a French person who, you know, argument is like the natural, like the national pastime, <laughs> um, I'm always kind of baffled at the reluctance to. Mm -hmm hold the nuance and complexity of the conversation. And in this case, around, um, a, around trans women is it's like, just because we're talking about our black and brown and Latinx sisters doesn't mean that we're excluded from the conversation. It just means that they are at the pointy end. They are at the pointy end. And we know this in the community, you know? Um, I have some concern for folks who you know, <clears throat> masculine presenting folks who pass um, and who, you know, butch dykes, like oftentimes when I, th and this is actually a question I had for you around, because they're, <laughs> cause they're, they're out there. But one of my questions for you is specifically around data is it's like, how do you get numbers on mm -hmm. the invisible? So mm -hmm. for example, anecdotally, right, I volunteered at the so, you know, there's a massive amount of homeless youth in New York City. The percentage of it has not changed since the 70s. It is mm -hmm. a real fact that being trans or queer as a kid still means you get kicked out of your home. There mm -hmm. still is a necessity for all of these shelters, specifically for young queers in New York City. And a couple of years ago, they tried to like take all of the funding away and everyone was like, Sure, maybe in New York City, these kids are safe, but they're not from New York. Like, it's like, this is, so, um, but I volunteered at one of these places. And of course, you know, there were all of, you know, all of the girls come in, you know, all of the, you know, young gay boys. But it was very, even though I knew they were out there, the young butches mm -hmm. almost never came in to receive any services. And when I spoke to the executive of this particular not-for-profit for kids, I asked why that was. And he said, you know, they are the most reluctant group to be counted. It's mm -hmm. like, safe, it's as, as a safety thing. So I guess one of the things I wanted to know, because one of the questions I wanted to ask you is it's like, you know, what's the, what's the best data? What's the worst data? Mm -hmm. Different sources of data, but what do you do when you can't actually count? It's a really good question. Um, I started making notes because so many things came up while you were talking and I didn't want to lose sight of it. The first thing is that as soon as you started talking, I was like, wow, I was really talking shit when, and you very politely didn't point out to me that I was talking shit. <laughs> this idea about trans men being the bogeyman is actually absolutely not true. It's trans women where it's perceived, like they're still just perceived no matter what. <laughs> as their biological sex at birth. And then yeah. Actually, trans men in a transphobic world are non-threatening because you're not threatening to us because you're not a man, basically. So absolute bullshit, trans men aren't the bogeymen, it's still trans women who are the bogeymen, and we're very, very polite to not point out. <laughs> Which in turn made me think about um, a cis friend of mine who is like a cis woman who was in the bathroom, but she, you know, and she says this um, herself, like she, she's quite masculine presenting, she's quite androgynous, you know, she likes to wear her hair short, whatever. She said she was just doing her makeup in the bathroom in New York and a woman came in and was like, what the fuck? What the fuck? What the fuck are you doing in here? And went and got management and like, this friend was just so calm and just like continued to do her makeup, like while like, like honestly dying inside and feeling really, really humiliated. Um, 
mostly because of like the kerfuffle, not of the accusation that's just yeah. trans women. Oh, it's intimidating when that happens. And I think it's really, really important. The reason why I mention all of this is because we so often, and rightly so, again, it's a question of vulnerability, right? And as you say, like the most vulnerable groups are overwhelmingly trans women and trans women of color. But we can't like ring fence off everything perfectly. When you persecute one group, everyone fucking loses. In a world where gender is policed, I also lose, even as a cis woman. I don't want, like, I don't want to have to wear my hair a certain way, to have to dress a certain way. And in a world where you're policing gender, all of us, all of us lose. So that's the um, one side note. That's thing. something, but is that yeah. something that people, that, that, that when you talk to, when you talk to your, to your friends, your colleagues, because mm. I know that this is a conversation that we're all having, is that something that is connected for them? No, because I think people think, a lot of cis people just think of ge their gender as like this be all and end all, and the notion that there could ever be any confusion. Or, like, I, I think a lot, of, a lot of people just haven't even interrogated it themselves to understand the ways in which, I don't know, their own gender is constructed. Like, yeah. Yeah, like, yeah, right. um, and I think because that work hasn't been done, and because maybe they've never been accused of, of, of not accused, they've been called out in that way in like a public setting. It just doesn't even factor into the conversation. But like, I mean, it's so related. To, I know it sounds fucked up, but it's also related to a notion that women have to dress a certain way in the office. Is it is in a fucked up way related to this whole notion of how, what gender means, you know? Yeah, I mean, it completely is, right? Like, so gender is, you know, and again, kind of like, we're just talking about gender and mm -hmm. sometimes people like to conflate gender and sexuality. And I love your example of your cisgendered friend who likes to wear her short, who's fairly androgynous, who was in the restroom, just minding her own business, doing her own thing. The only thing that was being policed at that point was how she was doing woman. Mm, that's, exactly. that's what was being policed, right? That that it didn't work, that it didn't fit. Even yeah. though, and I can say for me, even though it terrifies me to go into men's bathrooms, mm. even though I'm like, I don't want to learn how to how to go into another type of bathroom. Mm. Like in my mind, of course, you know this. I'm autistic, right? So in my mind, I had imagined that like the geography of the bathroom was totally different. That like I was gonna go in and I wasn't gonna know what to do and whatever. So I had to have some of my cisgendered guy friends like break down that it's the same thing as a women's bathroom, just inverted. And I was mm -hmm. like, got it, because I'm like, oh, you walk into the bathroom, the stalls are on the right, there's a sink on your left, you figure it out. Well, it's the total opposite in men's bathrooms, right? Because women's bathrooms are always on the same side or mm -hmm. almost always, right? And then men's bathrooms are always on the other side. And so it's just a mirror image of it. Mm -hmm. And somehow that made it easier for me to go in, but it's still terrifying because I'm like, oh, if there's a dude in here that clocks that I'm not a cisgendered guy, depending on where I am in the United States, I get very, very mm -hmm. nervous. Because at that point, they're not fucking going to call management. Mm -hmm. Like they will but men don't look at each other in bathrooms. Like there's no eye contact. And I've had to just kind of rely on patriarchy to like performative mm -hmm. patriarchy to like do her thing so that safety is established in the men's bathroom for me. But women's bathrooms are very different. Like, yeah. you know, it's very kind of like, it's not, it's not performative because that's performative too, but there is a lot more engagement in a way. Um, mm -hmm. But I would, if I could, I would still go into women's bathrooms just because mm -hmm. I grew up in them. I was an athlete. Like, I just, I don't understand why I have to be so close to men. Yeah. 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 Right? I don't, you know. <laughs> yeah, yeah. I just want to just want to give one more non-bathroom example. And then I want to answer your question about data and valuable data sources and all of those things. So the okay. non-data example um, is, um, so I am a, um, uh, um, ethnically Arab woman, which makes me really fucking hairy, right? So right. I like made this um, radio documentary all about women's facial hair, um, in which I interviewed your friend JD, who is amazing, <laughs> yeah, and a bunch of other people. And that again is something that like, actually it's, it's completely normal for like people, for biologically female people to have facial hair, like there's nothing, but you know, again, that gets policed. And it's one of, weirdly, I would say like it's one of the most strictly policed 
forms of gender, right? Like if I were to go out with facial hair immediately, like more than, more than an item of clothing, more than how I cut my hair, like that is the demarcation that I have made a switch. Right. Um, and I just find it really, really interesting. And JD had so many like fucking fascinating thoughts about it. It's amazing. JD was one of the first ones. I mean, even mm. within the oh, queer community that was just like, this is my face. Yeah. And yeah. just kind of like un unapologetic about it. But I, I think I, I would argue that what, again, kind of like what, what is being policed and you mm -hmm. said it exactly, right? And I think that we are up against this in a very real way is it's like, so you're ethnically Arab, right? Mm -hmm. And I think that we could have just stopped there, right? Because the thing that's being policed is actually whiteness and then mm -hmm. femininity in relationship to the white male gaze. And I, mm -hmm. I, I, you know, you asked me this question about like, oh, well, uh, you know, do, do I feel excluded in the conversation? I, I don't, but one of the larger issues that I have with kind of like the global conversation that's happening is it's like, I, it's so important that we be precise about the language that we're using and, yeah. and the system that at least here in the global north and kind of decimated in the global south has been a result of white supremacist colonialist patriarchy right mm -hmm. like it's like and so y your body is being policed i think in direct relationship mm -hmm. to that so it can it can control you know your your, you know, it can control my femininity and my masculinity. It could control, you know, how, whether or not, you know, being here suit is attractive or sexually not. Like it's all about, it's all wrapped up in whether or not you and me are speaking by the choices that we make are in dialogue with the desire of a white supremacist colonialist dude, cisgendered guy. And- and the work of having to unlearn that. Unlearn it. Is so huge. And also, I'm sure everyone that's watching this will already be, if they're like fans of yours, they're not gonna, they're not gonna need like the 101 course. But the extent to which we can be complicit in it, particularly actually cis women, like what I heard time and time again when I was researching this piece, is it was an auntie or a mother that took a young girl to one side and was like, we need to do something about your hair. It never came from men. It was like women being like, this is not, this is not acceptable. This is what we have to deal with. So this, I, like, I know it's just so, so dumb and obvious to say, but like the, the ways that women and femme people can be complicit in this patriarchy wholeheartedly is also like, you know, worth exploring. Totally. I mean, you know, there's this beautiful book that's called 99, that, uh, the Feminism for the 99%. And, and it talks about kind of this, um, uh, this i this idea one of the many things that it talks about is that you know we don't want as feminists the same hierarchical mm. systems that position more women in the positions of power that have proven to be problematic and so we see it as kind of like the very you know the 10 years ago, people were like, oh, well, you know, we have a woman CEO, we have a, but the system is broken. All it does is kind of put a, a woman and it's also very kind of um, patronizing to imagine that, that a woman is incapable of the same degree of cruelty at the CEO level than a man. And so I think that one of the things you're talking about is this idea that, yes, indeed, that is true, right? Like, like as young girls, I was raised up as a young girl and I saw it in my mom as someone who was kind of, um, you know, uh, sent out to police and teach us how to be girls. But it was, I mean, and clearly that's... <laughs> work out but it's but but it's true it is often something that is it's worth examining and i think it's uncomfortable because mm -hmm. then you know maybe some of the choices that we make are choices that 
we would make differently if we understood that it was in some sort of subliminal relationship to this thing we actually don't even want to be involved with or connected to in any way. Yeah. Like yeah. I have spent time and money and physical pain on hair removal that I, I don't want to do it. And like, and it's also especially disappointing when you've interrogated all of the reasons for why you do it. And all you're left with is, I don't want to make, I don't want to move through the world in a way that's more difficult. I just don't want to, I just don't want to face. And when you're left with that as like the reason why you do something is just like ease. That's also like really uncomfortable. Yeah. I mean, I can identify with that, right? Like I'm a trans person who doesn't take hormones. So for the mm -hmm. most part, as soon as I ta start talking, I become very confusing mm -hmm. to people because I have a high voice, you know, it's a, it's a soft kind of more feminine looking voice. And that juxtaposed with the presentation of my body really scrambles people. And, mm -hmm. and, and the, the, you know, like I think about it sometimes I'm like, Oh, well maybe I, maybe I should be doing something differently. Cause I, you know, it's kind of like you're having to constantly um, make the choice. Am I going to go through this more easily or am I going to going to be connected to who I am? And then also it becomes complicated when you realize, Oh, this thing that I've done and the choices that I've made that sure make it easier for me to walk around in the world. I actually want to do. Yeah. Yeah. That's okay too, but at least the process of un of like taking it back, of owning it, has yeah. been something yeah. that you've done, you know? Yeah. Yeah. And hmm. then I want to ask this question about data as well, before I forget, which I think is so important. Like, I'm really, really glad that you asked it because I'm actually so skeptical of data. Like, I think so much of it is bullshit. I think so much of it replicates the systems of power. How oh, come? Can you, wait, can you like... A Cause not everyone's gonna, can you pull, okay. like, what do you mean by that? Cause I agree. And yeah. I think, and I think that that's something that, you know, cause, okay. So we're talking about white supremacy, racism, mm -hmm. patriarchy, mm -hmm. like that is the system you work with numbers. And so go so ahead. It's baked into every single question. So with, let's just continue with the, with the topic that we've been talking about so far. So people whose gender doesn't fit into those two very simple boxes, which are tick, male or female, right? Mm -hmm. And in, I would say, virtually every single data set I'm looking at, those are the two columns that I have, right? If, if gender is going to be in there, it will say male and female. And so... The data set itself replicates the systems of power because we live in a world that is still overwhelmingly binary. Like, it's so funny, I still forget because I think I spend time with like queer friends that there are just huge, like overwhelmingly, this country as a whole, the UK as a whole, thinks male and female, right? Wow. And so the data set itself repli has replicated that system of power when that's the way that the questions are phrased. So, um, what that means is that very often the data can't really, it's kind of reflecting back those systems of power. Do you know what I mean? Like yeah. it's limited in that, in that sense. So for example, right, I really, really wanted to do something. In fact, there's been a few times when I've tried to do illustrations on transgender topics. The first time um, was a few years ago and I used, I, I want to say that I used data that came from the Williams Institute. Do you know them? Yep. Yeah, it's UCLA, I think. Yeah. And they've, they've had a really, really long history of researching all of this. But again, it's a very specialised academic institute, or else there's also a... Um, it's a transgender rights organisation whose name I forget that also does research in this area. And I believe they're also connected to homeless shelters. Yeah. And so because they have a relationship with the community, there's that trust there yeah. to ask people questions that like, you know, I don't, there's a trust there, but there's also a fucking desire to ask those questions because they understand the stakes, whereas no one else gives a shit to ask these questions. So anyway, sorry, New York. <laughs> um, that was a car horn and not my butt, just in case they <laughs> <laughs> okay, I'm in Vermont and there were gunshots. So oh, great. I, 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 it's a little different, but it's like, wow, okay. This is the auditory <laughs> landscape each of us are in, it's crazy. Um, so this Williams Institute data was asking about, have you ever attempted suicide at any point in your life? Have you ever suffered from depression and anxiety? Have you ever been fired from a job? And then it was just comparing those responses to the cisgendered population to be able to show 
all of these areas of vulnerability. Yeah. Um, and I, I think I did another one around about the time that the military ban was put in place by Trump. Yeah. And, and then recently, I just wanted to focus on the straight up homicide rate in the context of everything that's happening and the conversations about police brutality and just like, just black deaths more generally. And the thing that was really, really disappointing is I found one piece of research, like one academic study. And let me just give you a bit of context here, right? I'm looking up academic research all the fucking time. And you would not believe the number of things that get funding. I literally found a research paper the other day that looked at the, the way that penguin fecal matter, fecal matter, whatever, the, the penguin shits basically, <laughs> the way that penguin shits uh, come out of the penguin's butt and into the water and was tracking that trajectory. And it was an update on the initial research. It was round two of how penguin shits travel. <laughs> and there is one transgender study. Are you fucking joking me? You know, like, Anyway, so I found this, I found this study, I produced this graphic. That's and, so like, fucked. That's it so is so fucked, Lucy. And like, you know what? That was just from a very cursory look. I'm sure there is a great deal more than two studies on penguin shits, like truly. Um, and so it's a reflection again of the systems of power. Who gets to be an academic? What, what is considered worthy of funding when you go before a board and say this topic matters? Right. And, like again, we're living in a world where transgender lives are here and penguin turds are here in terms of right. academic research. Yes. Um, and so I reach out to um, an academic who herself is a, is a trans woman um, for her research, like produced this graphic and she, it's, I feel bad for her. She like all of a sudden freaked out when it came out. She got an email from someone saying that her numbers were wrong and she had fucked up on the numbers, which is really, really shit. Um, cause it was like published wrong and like whatever. And these things happen, like they, ha they, they happen, happen all the time. Yeah. They happen all the time. But when it comes to vulnerable communities, there's like a whole extra bar where you're already going to be accused of fabricating the research. And the thing that's really scary for the work that I do is I'm creating these illustrations that then live on in the world. Right. So this, yeah. uh, um, Instagram account called Feminist shared the illustration, right? Obviously without asking me for anything, whatever, you know, they just went ahead and shared it. I think they have like, I don't know, 20 million followers, who the fuck knows. So even after I took it down, it's living on in their account. I've commented underneath being like, these numbers are wrong. I'm still seeing that graphic get shared with the wrong numbers. Right. So I'm like, on the one hand, right, the graphic was really important. It was trying to show literally intersectionality. So it shows a homicide rate for different races, homicide rate for trans people versus everyone. It's not even cis people because we don't think in those terms, right? So we have the overall national homicide right. rate and then this transgender research. And you literally see highlighted black and trans because that's where it's highest, right? right? And we also know that's true, right? That's still the case that the black homicide, the black trans homicide rate is higher than all of these other groups. But the fact that the numbers are off still really, really sticks in my throat because yeah, it's just shit. It's just really, really fucking shit. Um, oh, uh, yeah. How, why were the numbers wrong? I guess is my- It's like, so easy to get them wrong in her defense. Like all it takes is you literally looking at the wrong row of a spreadsheet or like looking, or just making one calculation as you're going along that's wrong. Right. And in defense as well, the whole role, the whole reason why I lean so heavily on academic research is because it's supposed to be peer reviewed by two people before it gets to publication. So two experts within that field are supposed to check every single calculation. Right. And I honestly wonder if part of the reason why it was missed was because I suspect, this is pure conjecture, those two people that were checking it weren't themselves experts in transgender research. research. And so they're like, oh yeah, looks good, looks good. And that's what happens. Like you don't get to a more accurate understanding until like we're all invested in those answers. And the more of us care about um, getting the answers, the better that that research is. You know, I, I just spoke with Chase, so it's on my mind, but he said two things that were kind of so interesting he was like you know it's so important that that cis women understand that an attack on trans women is an attack on them right that it is about policing women that trans women are women and that it's being kind of like hidden and repackaged as this other thing but that mm -hmm. it ultimately is about controlling women's bodies there is no we were talking about idaho and what's happening in idaho there is no equivalent it's only banning female trans athletes from participating high school athletes so kids mm. from, from participating in their sport uh 
uh, uh, as their gender, right? There's no equivalent for men. So it's mm -hmm. the burden is solely on the bodies of women. And I think it's so important. It's something that you said reminded me of that. But the other thing that Chase said is it's like, we talk about this in this, you know, he works within court systems and this court got created as a colonialist structure to protect the people in power. And so you can only go in there and, you know, dismantle it or buy time while the rest of the world kind of catches up culturally. And then the conversation changes because the court on its own cannot protect or represent the rights of humans and culture. And I think that in many ways, data is the same thing, right? Like if there was, and he also said that it's so important that, you know, it, that, you know, and have you watched the documentary Disclosure yet? I started watching, I'm halfway through, I'm halfway so through. So one of the, my favorite quotes is um, by this actor named Jen, and she says, you know, if there were, if there were more representations of trans bodies in mm -hmm. television, in the world, then the occasional clumsy representation would have a larger context. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And I think that, that to your point, that around data, around these fragile communities that are, you know, kind of like at the pointy end of oppression, where, you know, gathering any sort of data, not only does that work have to be done, but then it has to be translated into a system that actually at its core has maintaining the status quo, which is, you know, kind of continuing oppression. And so it's very, I think it's, you know, one of the things that I kind of ongoingly love about your work is like your dogged persistence to try to make those numbers actually mean something to people so that they can identify with them and have them not remain just numbers but then it becomes really complicated when you can't even get those numbers and then when you do and they're not like the burden of excellence remains on that one study that one graph to demonstrate what all of us actually know anecdotally but mm -hmm. how do we and so then it makes me think like okay well so you know, the, another question that I had for you was like, okay, so how I wrote it, it's like, okay, so in a perfect world, yeah, not just what does data look like, but what is it used for, mm. right? Because right now, what you're doing is like translating, like you're doing something that's not dissimilar to what Chase is doing, right? Like you're using mm -hmm. all of these numbers that come out of institutions that have been questionably created, but that are where excellent minds kind of go. You and I have both gone to those institutions and we did, you know, really well and I got a wonderful education from them, but I've since had to kind of like, you know, I had to do so much more work than what was being offered in order to begin to understand, in my case, this queer body, queer narrative, there are a lot of academics that talk about it, you know, like Jack Haberstam, queer failure. Like there are a lot of words around what might be a different understanding in Jack's case of like success or failure and that queers are actually were quite good at understanding what failure is and resilience and things like that. But it makes me, I, I guess I wonder, you know, what would, in a perfect world, what does data look like? And then what is it, used for because right now it's almost like you know we're doing everything we can to try to hold the stories so it's coming from not necessarily a defensive posture but like this is the reality like here it is translated again in these beautiful drawings you use so many kind of like strategies and getting that information out there in a way that is easily digestible but it's kind of like, wow, that is so much, that is, what would be better? Yeah. So I think like the ideal scenario, right, for now in this world that we're living in, is that I share information that helps inform people so that they can make the best decisions for their own lives, right? So like whether it's me literally 
sharing like the risks of different kinds of contraception like one of my other obsessions is like how badly medical packaging is designed and if it was like something that helps people to understand the side effects of contraception so the people who were taking contraception would feel informed and empowered to make the decisions that are right for them that's like ideal world right but i would say that actually, i love this so ideal world I mean, especially since, you know, it's actually super relevant because, you know, the Supreme Court just ruled today. I'm sure. Right? I'm sure. Yeah. And I think, I mean, while as kind of like deeply fucked up that is and contraception should be available, like I just, I'm like, it, I don't, I, 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 I consider myself as someone who's like able to kind of like understand where the other person is coming from just like contraception it's no fucking brainer it's none of your business for starters and two it should just be readily available like mm -hmm. family planning readily available like when women want to have kids readily available they get mm -hmm. to make the choice something whatever it shouldn't be exorbitant pricing there's no equal burden of that on mm -hmm. men there's no equal burden of that on men so just like get the fuck off our backs motherfuckers yeah. so but it makes me wonder is it's like, oh, if the packaging was different, right? If somehow you would be able to like embody some sort of like, uh, you know, more translational effect around the side effects, maybe there would be more options available, mm -hmm. right? Like maybe they wouldn't have even focused on contraception. Maybe they would have just like focused on something else, you know? Yeah. Yeah. like again every single time you talk like three things come up that i'm trying to like hold while still making sure that i'm present and listening to you so the one thing on like how it's just like not about men's or like masculine bodies the way that the way that this is policed um just so dumb i saw a tiktok last night of a, of a girl like it's like two teenage girls that are like joking around on tiktok and one of them wants to go and this is fucked up for so many reasons anyway she wants to go and get her nails done and her friend's like well how did you get 50 bucks to get your nails done and she's like oh i told my my boyfriend that i needed the morning after pill and her friend's like but aren't you on contraceptive like aren't you on the regular pill already and she's like yeah but he doesn't know that so he gave me the 50 dollars and i asked him for another 50 so i could take two morning after pills to be on the safe side so she gets a hundred dollars from her boyfriend then they're both like cackling and it's like it's funny but it's also just not funny at all at all at all anyway side note and um, then the other thing that i was also thinking when you were talking about contraception is that like it's really interesting to me that it's not like as like whatever that obviously there's marriage that comes into it when you're supposed to be having sex and blah, blah, blah. but like contraception among many muslims just isn't a big deal by the way abortion among many muslims not a big deal you can be very very religious and that's not a problem um again depends exactly where you are but whatever and it's just so interesting to me that again when we're talking about feminism we're never really saying western feminism but no. we're talking about western feminism yeah. and this notion that like Islamic feminism or like all of these other countries are obviously behind us. So once we have it figured out, then they'll be okay. They'll like come along the way. Like, no, 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 actually they figured out some shit that you probably need to figure out. And like, anyway, side so note. True. No, I, I will add to that side note. One of my really good friends is, uh, you know, she is in Sweden now, but from Lebanon and that mm. she's just like, let us take it from here. Yes. Ladies, like we're good. <laughs> We have figured it, and it just, it's like, it is so true, right? Like, it's often we forget, I think, and again, it like kind of brings me back to like, we got so much from Black feminist mm -hmm. intersectional theory, and I think that because, I mean, it just, it's like, that is some like real shit there, you know? And then what other women did with feminism all over the world. And I think, you know, kind of like the easiest illustration is my mother-in-law who's now passed was like staunch feminist. She's from Denmark, but she grew up on a farm. So when the feminists in the United States were burning their bras, she was like, what are you talking about? Cause she never wore one. Yeah, yeah, yeah. There was See, no emancipation in that. That's what I was going to say. I don't know if these are wins that like Muslim women or Arab women have won. It's that the patriarchy took a different form now. So like, like the patriarchy isn't the same everywhere. Do you know what I mean? So another yeah. one, another example. My mum told me this. I, I, I was quite old when I found this out. She said that my sister like came home as like this little kid from school and was like, mum, why don't you have the same name as dad? 
and mum was like why would I why would I change my last name and my sister was like but everyone at school like all of their mums have got the same names as their dad so my my mum was worried about my sister's confusion like no woman changes their last name in Iraq that's not what you do when you get married you keep like your name is your name and so she did that just to conform to like this, like she just signed up to like a little touch of Western patriarchy, just to like keep her five-year-old daughter unconfused. Fuck knows. Anyway. That, so I mean, I think, which is a common story, right? Like, it's just like, yeah. oh, okay, this, we've got this right, but I'm just going to do this, you well, know. Sign, sign me up, yeah. Um, so anyway, side note. So you're right, that is an important degree of nuance. It's not necessarily wins that we've had. It's just that the patriarchy took a different form elsewhere, but it still shows another way of being, you know, yep. like. And exploring other ways of being is worthwhile and valid. And then the other thing I was going to say really, really um, quickly, which is about what this data is useful. So again, best case scenario, it's informing people so they can make the best decisions about their lives, whether that's about whether or not to wear a fucking mask during COVID or where to, whether or not to go to a restaurant or whether it is like, you know, as I said, like um, contraception. But I think, honestly, a lot of that stuff is quite lofty or ambitious. And out, particularly outside of, the health um outside of health i don't know if it necessarily makes sense so honestly i think a lot of it's so funny like do you follow chani nichols yeah yeah so she's I mean, an astrologer for yeah, she's an astrologer. who she is yeah i really feel like a lot of what i do is basically astrology and horoscopes right like and that's not me trying to like seriously because she asked me to like do a reading of mine and I was like like all of my friends know I don't celebrate my birthday no one's allowed to know my sign and the reason why whatever I'm gonna get down a whole rabbit hole here okay <laughs> go Mona go Mona my, my, okay my really really simple point here is that what Chani does which I think is really really important and I'm not shitting on it at all is she lets people feel seen they see a, a post which is like oh my god it's cancer season cancers are going to be doing I, I don't again i don't know anything about cancer is going to be doing x y and z and all these people who are cancers are like that's me that's me and i think that on another on in a very similar way some of what i'm doing is to be like your likelihood of not getting a promotion is this if you're this race you're this ethnicity you're this gender you're this age group whatever so you didn't get the fucking promotion at work you look up my chart and you're like oh shit and you feel seen and you feel like comforted in this knowledge that it's not just you it's part of a higher system a higher structure and i think in some ways that could be really disempowering right so we we could also have a whole conversation about france right france has very interesting rules on data collection and when i speak to my french friends um, like who are very very adamant about the importance of not collecting data on certain things and the thing is like the arguments are actually really fucking like my friends who I respect so much they're making these compelling arguments right so for example my friends Elaine were saying to me imagine we've collected data because you know how like Arab Muslims are like massively discriminated against obviously in France or yeah just like so imagine we know that but just a little background for people who are okay, listening sorry, to yeah, you. and I think that we can like I think it's super useful right because I think there, there is a way that racism manifests here in the United States. It's systemic, it's based in slavery, and it's specific, it, for the most part, I mean, it doesn't discriminate in who it discriminates against, but for the most part, it lands on the body of black bodies. In France, because of the same colonialism that happened in the United States, it's colonized in different countries. And so it's mostly Arab Muslims who bear the brunt of a very similar experience than the one that is experienced by black bodies here. And one of the things that I, I think that I'm surprised we don't talk about this more because it is the one of the perfect examples of the construct that like racism isn't it is real in its manifestation, but it is arbitrary and it's not racism because that then puts the focus on the bodies rather than the system. It's white supremacy. Like that is the, and it manifests in a bunch of different million ways. Racism is one of them. But so anyway, for context for people who don't understand kind of like French history or any type of history, but um, that's what Mona was talking about for a second. oh did i are we gonna cut out what's happening what's am i frozen are you there yeah i'm there? here yeah am i here yeah uh -oh. hold on a second you're there you're there you're there we're good, oh, we're my good. Bad. Thank God. 
I've got stress. Okay, dude, sorry. You, <laughs> we shouldn't be talking about, we shouldn't be talking about that shit. We shouldn't be talking about what? Oh, my God, Casey, I took you seriously. I was like, who's here? Um, oh, my God. Okay. Um, okay, okay, so anyway, that was a total side note to give no, people context. Really okay. I really appreciate I think it's so important that at no point on this call are you presuming anything of the audience, which is very, very important. Um, the other thing that, that just came up while you were saying that as well is obviously, like, I think it's really, really hard to understand racism without gender. Like, it's so hard. Like, and particularly, again, in France, the, the, I, I don't know why I keep on wanting to say bogeyman, but, like, the, the, the spectre of fear is an Arab man specifically. Like, as an Arab woman, I had, like, shitty experiences there, mostly by being exoticized or people just being so desperate to know, like, where my family was from. But I wasn't... Um, I wasn't dangerous in the same way as I would have been had I been masculine. Anyway, right. um, and just like obviously, that is also the case over here that like it's it, you know black men and black women like have different experiences in different ways. Anyway, um, but so this friend we were talking so to get to step back a few steps, we were talking about the validity and the usefulness of presenting data. So this friend of mine is like. Imagine that we had data on your life chances as an, um, an Arab man in France, right? You're born in France, but your parents were Algerian, you're born here. And at the age of 17, you see a chart that says, do you know what? 95% chance you're going to stay poor. 95% chance you're going to go to, I'm making up these numbers, but you see what I mean. What does that do to someone? to be told in that way, like, this is how life's going to go for you. And I actually, I really do understand the argument, because by the way, that's the reason why I won't fucking tell anyone my star sign. I don't want Chani to say to me, oh, by the way, because, you're, yes. because your sign is this, you're like this, because even if it's wrong, it's going to be in my fucking head. The next time I, like, go out on a date and, like, start shouting at a man which is happens quite often like i'm gonna be thinking in my head oh like fucking pisces move instead of just being like this is me i like i don't want that frame of understanding and yet at the same time that's exactly what i'm doing to people when i'm presenting them with this data so i feel so conflicted about this tension between letting someone be seen letting them understand that there are systems that are holding them back and it's not just them between also like giving them this sense that like that's life and you're just fucked. You right. know? I'll give one, one last example, yeah. which was actually really, really nice. Like, I feel like so often what I'm doing is being like, you know, there are other people like you. That's kind of the vibe in so much of my research is like, you're not alone. Look at these other people that are going through something similar. What was fascinating is I did um, a piece on dying in America and just the funeral industry. And it's become so fucking expensive to die in this country. Yeah. And it's a moral outrage and go fund me for funerals and all of this stuff. So anyway, I created two very simple illustrations as part of that, which was just the age you are when your parents die. And it's cumulative data, so it shows that like kids who are zero, like between the ages of zero to three, the probability that their mother will be dead, that their father will be dead. And it's just this really beautiful, sorry, it's this really beautiful <laughs> um, kind of curve that just goes up towards 100% the older that you get, because obviously like, you know, there's no 90 year olds with parents who are still living. Right. Um, so it's like this really, really smooth and someone said to me like actually the reason that i was comforted was in seeing how few people had been through what i had been through like i had lost both of my parents before i was 18. this was a friend of mine who i didn't even know i mean it's an acquaintance from work we're not super close um she had lost both of her parents before she was 18 and seeing that there was no she felt so alone and actually she felt alone because she largely was alone there were so few other people who had lost both parents and that was weirdly reassuring to her it was super interesting yeah. last, thing I'll say, last thing i'll say no i mean i think i hope it's not the last thing you say but it reminds me of one of my favorite books growing up was um uh the trial by kafka and in the trial by kafka it just is kind of like you enter into this system this guy is on trial it's never fully explained why and it remains kind of like this this um you you understand the oppression of a system by the absence of the inf by the description of the absence of information right that is what that is one of the things that i so deeply kind of related to in reading this and i think that one of the things that you're saying is that yes your data gives the information 
about the trial, right? Like your data is giving information about what's happening. And I immediately thought of how comforting that would feel. And you've mm -hmm. anecdotally illustrated it, that people are finding that there is comfort in that. But I would say that it's even more profound than comfort is it makes you feel sane. Mm -hmm. Like it, it there is by society society is gaslighting you and saying you know what actually casey like i don't think you have it any harder because you're like masculine presenting and then to see data that's like oh no actually i mean you know that anyway but do you know what i mean like there yeah. are all of these forces that are undermining your experience on a regular basis yeah and to see that i think can be quite validating yeah oh it's 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 it may you know so it's like i think about a, you know um going back to what we were first talking about is like this anxiety around difference and otherness, right? Mm -hmm. And it's an anxiety around difference and otherness based on this overarching, you know, white cisgendered supremacist um, patriarchy. And, mm -hmm. and it's, we can't just like any theory fully understand the extent of this system until we start putting words to it and one of the things that you do is you illustrate it so it's it's not so it lives kind of in conjunction with all of the other lenses and glasses that we have that help us understand this system that we are in that does not have us that does not have our best interest in mind right and so it makes me think that while yes it on the one hand some people might find it discouraging and or defeatist right because mm -hmm. they're like oh well these are the stats so i'm going to just that's just how it is um i would be curious to see how many people actually have that response. Mm -hmm. I mean, I think that your friends in France are more nervous about any sort of data around being an Arab man, because if that data existed in France, then it's not a good look for, it's really it's not not good look for France. And I think that it is more indicative of France's reluctance, which is historical, mm -hmm. to even acknowledge that the, the harm that they have caused or that they are god for like an oppressive regime like mm -hmm. that so i think it has it has less to do with how the truth is told to the people who are like mm -hmm. experiencing the anxiety of being othered and it's like oh yeah well you know here is actually everyone else who's being othered or suffering the consequences of it in all of the similar ways so i was just furloughed and it I knew was, this. I don't know why I'm shocked. I, I, it's awful that I actually had forgotten. That's really yeah. bad. Yeah, Casey. So I was, I, I was furloughed two weeks ago, and you know, I oh, have. Oh, I thought you was furloughed at the start of this. No. no, no, no. So I kept my. I was able to keep my job for three months, which was amazing, and I love my job. You know about my job, but <laughs> yeah. <laughs> but one of the. Thing, you know, it was a. I hated having the conversation. It was deeply humiliating. I experienced all of the things that I think any normal human experiences when it's like you become um, unnecessary, right? And uh, it, dispendable. In my case, for a period of time, right? Being furloughed has a time limit. My job will be offered back to me again. But it. But however, um, one of the things that immediately helped me was because despite all of my safety nets I still felt horrible about it like it's not like I had that conversation and was like no problem like I'm king of the world I'm going at it I got all these other projects like I felt horrible self-esteem um, mm -hmm. I cried like I just I felt like a failure like I could have done more and uh the thing that helped me is like, I am so not the only one going through this. Like it is an actual, and the thing that helped was understanding the numbers and that statistically the chances of me or my wife actually losing our jobs 
we're pretty, we're high, you know? And of course I have all these other projects. I get to work on my second book. I get to develop this TV show. Like I get to do all these other things because that's always been a part of my work, but to lose this, this job that I liked and that I loved, it was so helpful and so comforting and then helped me cope, which I think is something that we also get to talk about is it's like, oh, okay, so sure, what happens with that information? Well, you get that information and you get not just comfort, but company, and then also an understanding that you get perspective, right? Mm -hmm. And we were talking about domestic violence at the beginning of this is it's like, and the disbelief that most victims of domestic violence have around ever having been, ever ending up in that position, mm -hmm. right? And uh, I was, uh, I'm a domestic violence survivor. And what's amazing is that the first thing that any therapist will tell you or show you are the numbers. And they don't only show you the numbers, but they show you the education level, they show you the income level. They yeah. show, and, and it is so comforting because you're like, oh, I am this super smart, you know, very tall, very, you know, former Olympian, strong feminist person who still managed to, you know. Okay. No, it. no, it did it. It's doing it. It's doing it. Great. I have no idea what we missed, but here we are again. No, here we are again. Well, we were talking about this cheerful subject of um, domestic violence. And, uh, but what I was saying was that the data normalized the experience I was having because I think that, and again, it brings me back to the point that we were talking about at the beginning, which is also kind of like this challenge of, you know, globalizing, of course, but this idea that like, Americans for the most part kind of believe that they are having this very unique experience and and you know western feminism thinks that feminism should then be applied the same way globally when actually you know a woman's experience is varied and textured and is in is totally different depending on which part of the world that you're in and so it just it's like this idea that this idea that I'm that we're not that we're not alone that the experience I'm having is one that is predictable that it's not the interminable trial of Kafka actually I think makes a difference I mean it would be really I would be curious I think you should I think you should do kind of like a I don't know what kind of data collection tool this is but kind of like a do you, once you understand the numbers about your condition, do you have a negative or positive experience? Mm -hmm. I or whatever? Totally, totally. So wait, the one thing I wanted to come, okay, I feel like this is potentially relevant to answer the question. Will you, seeing as you did a great job of, of like um, summarizing the book, will you also mention how the book ends, if you remember? Do you remember how the trial ends? No, what happens? So it's really fascinating. So this guy moves through the thing and like, he's just like, what did I do wrong? And they're like, you know what you did wrong. He's like, what did I do wrong? And they're like, you know what you did wrong. And basically right at the end, they're like, um, do you accept that you did something wrong? And he's like, yeah. And he fully, fully believes it. And they're like, and he's like, what's my punishment? And they're like, you know what your punishment is. And I think he like throws himself off a cliff or something. Like he does it all himself. And no point is there any like, Coercion. Yeah. Coercion. Is oh, just well, there is, but it's not like kind of forced, no. right? Yeah. Like it's, yeah. And it's so interesting. I've never ever made this connection, but you're right. It's all within this, va this absolute vacuum of information where not a single thing is known about how this system works, how the trial works, what the punishment should be, anything. And again, it's like, how would that ending be different if he had understood, if he had had access to that information? So I guess my hope is also that in seeing some of this information, people are better equipped to resist. And resisting is like all we can do right now. Um, maybe it's not all we can do, but it feels like everything is- it's, it's one of the things that we can do. I also think it's super important that us as, you know, 
I, I think it's important. The other thing that Chase was saying is it's like, in his case, he was saying it's so important that kind of trans stories are told. Mm -hmm. And it's also so important that, you know, it is so important that people like you and me who are not white cisgendered men are the ones doing the storytelling. Because, you know, I wanted to interview someone. This is actually, this is totally relates. So I wanted to interview someone um, about uh, the, uh, the, the intersection between uh, extreme poverty, extreme inequity, but the economics of um, how that played out specifically around, um, a, around the prison industrial complex mm -hmm. that we have. And so I have a friend who is at a like, massively um, prestigious university he is a historian. So I, I said, do you have a historian who can tell the story, uh, a historian or economist who can tell this story holding kind of feminist economics, economics in light of this and kind of have an intersectional approach to how the data is accumulated. The chair of said prestigious university economics department wrote back saying, I actually don't know anyone who's doing this work. And I was like, yes, they were white, but I was like, I know that's not yeah. true. I know that's not true, but it's not happening there. Mm -hmm. And so there's a possessiveness around the information that I think is also the storytelling mm -hmm. that you and I who aren't attached to massive institutions like this in the same way are obligated and duty bound to keep telling them yeah. to keep yeah. translating. Do you ever feel like you need to give kind of context for your data? All the time, but it's like how much context could you possibly get? like, it's very, very difficult at what point you stop. Like in some ways, actually what I'm trying to do is to make data the context. So there will be like a headline about one person that's killed and I'm trying to like use the data to be like, this happens all the time or like these are the communities that are most affected or all of those things. So I'm kind of trying to make the data the context. But it's really hard because good data visualization makes choices, right? Like generally I can't show like, Right. data and geographical data and race and ethnicity and age groups and whenever people try to do that either you're left with like visual vomit or else it's an interactive and i'm actually not super in favor of interactives because i think what they do is they put the, they put the onus back on the on the reader or the viewer to be like you find whatever story you want to find and i don't know about you but very often and this is like a really well designed interactive i open it i click on two things i get tired and i close the tab and like that's not the work that like needs to be done. Like, I think part of my job is also to say to you, this is the most important thing. And then this is the next most important thing. And then this is the next most important thing. Um, so yeah, it's hard. So I guess, and we've been talking for a long time, so I don't want to take up much more of your time, but do you feel like, I mean, so I w wanted to also, um, cause you just started this, um, this kind of uh education resource but i and in my mind it's like, like the beginning of a conversation so when you create e these pieces that have so much information in them do you think of them as the beginning of a conversation or the integral part like when you make them do you imagine that their best use is not just mm. on their own or it's so hard like again i think that my primary audience for everything should be whoever is in the graphic itself right so let's say i'm creating a graphic about um Okay, this is really, really dumb, but for some reason it's coming to mind because you were talking about toilets. Uh, I created um, an illustration that was translating academic research about how the design of toilets is sexist 
because they don't they just make it so that the cues are much longer at the women's than the men's and there's yeah, that's right i remember that graphic it was amazing yeah so the main audience for that isn't actually men it's women like it's always that community so in that example right women know the queue time is longer right so it's kind of like it's not really the beginning of the conversation because because a lot of women know that they have to wait for longer at the at the bathroom it's like the middle of the conversation again it's like the tools to be able to resist so maybe like I know it sounds really, really dumb, but maybe there's just one person who sees that graphic who is part of a conversation with their company who is redesigning the second floor where they can go up to their boss and be like, hey, did you see this? Maybe we need to put more stools in the women's than in the men's right. so that this doesn't happen. Um, right. I don't know. I, I really, really don't know. And I'm still trying to figure out and this whole poster club idea. Like, it's funny, you kept on using the word conversation and I think that's absolutely right. Like, I don't see it as... I tell you and then I walk away. Like actually the moment at which I hit publish on like an Instagram post or whatever is like the beginning of the next iteration of it. You know, there's the work of finding the data, there's the work of the initial sketches, there's the work of asking friends and family, like does this thing make sense to you? And then when it's published, I get so much feedback that affects either the next thing that I do on that topic or just my future work. Like I really spend so much time in those comments. And my, my starting point for engaging with them is always an assumption that that person has something valid to offer. Yeah, right. And very often they do. Like, very often. And that's because there will always be someone in the comments who has a more direct relationship with that subject than I do. Like, I remember one of my most formative experiences was when I first started out in journalism, I wrote a piece for The Guardian about how the number of teen births was going down. I didn't even notice that my language in it was like basically implying this is a good thing and i just really think you remember one of the comments being like i gave birth as a teenager it was the best thing that ever fucking happened to me why are you framing it in this way and i was just like oh whoa i don't know what i'm talking about i really don't know what i'm talking about and like thank you and yeah yeah i love that i love that because it also makes me think it also makes me think of how many conversations I have where there is a presumption of knowledge mm -hmm. that a white man embodies that we as other are uh, unable to. Mm -hmm. Like, I don't, it's like that there is an ability to, um, because there's a, unique experience of having understood what it means to be other that when someone points out hey you didn't understand what it was like for me mm -hmm. there is some sort of like we almost have like an advantage in that sense because we are like oh it's kind of like the mechanism is the same so therefore that's the mechanism that's happening here i understand and it's correct because i have that experience over here in relationship to that you have this and so, but it makes me think about how flawed data, I mean, not to like, <laughs> some of my best friends are white cisgender dudes, but not to give it a bad rap, but it's kind of like, I wonder how flawed the data actually is. You deeply, know, because deeply flawed, deeply flawed. Again, like you will never see decimal places on my work because we don't know the truth to decimal places. I illustrate stuff by hand so that it's shaky, so that you don't walk away with like, oh right, I see this exact thing is here and this exact thing is here. No, no, no. What we do know with a great deal of certainty is this thing is twice as high as this thing, or this thing has grown, or this thing has fallen. Like we know those things, and I can say those with confidence. I'm not going to overstate what I know. And again, this was all born out. So I moved to America to work for Nate Silver's site. Yeah. The only, just all cis white men. I was the only writer who was a woman. I was the only writer who was not white. I was the only writer who was an immigrant. Like, I just stuck out like a fucking sore thumb. And I just used it as an asset because ultimately their arrogance, I think, was their undoing. Yeah. Because you just can't be sure about the work, especially when you're going to be doing something as stupid as predicting what people are going to do in the voting booth. Like, it's just such a dumb exercise. But anyway, um, anyway, yeah. Oh, the one the other thing I was gonna say, which is actually completely outside of the context of that particular professional experience, which was horrific and so, so awful, is that weirdly, I would say that being in America, 
has given me like a little taste because you know you're talking about like the discomfort of like acknowledging different forms of privilege well, this was actually before the call started and the things we've had to reckon with and like i would say that just having a british accent in america gives me a proximity to male authority and whiteness where the second that i speak it's like oh she, let's listen to what this person's saying because she's saying yeah. a fucking british accent so it gives you proximity to power Right? Exactly. exactly. Yeah. It's fucked up, but I always frame that around gender and race. Yeah. It does. It feels like all of a sudden, like, oh, this must be what it's like to, like, I mean, it's not what it's like to be a white man because I still look like this as I'm talking, but it is fascinating how much this accent has, t- has helped me out in this fucked up country. That's crazy. And so, what I find interesting is that just that you have the experience of it being a neutral and or negative experience in the in england or no so americans can't hear like any nuances in a british accent and like back home i wouldn't say like i sound rough but like to hear me speak you would never assume i'd gone to like a good institution you would never like i'm just from east london do you know what I mean? Like, and even still, I can also hear, like, even as I say, I'm from East London, like, my accent changes a little bit. Like, obviously, it depends on who you're with. And, like, there's not going to be an assumption, a positive, do you know what I mean? Assumption yep. about, necessarily. again, it depends on where you are. If I'm sitting on a panel talking about something, people might have a different set of expectations. But I just mean, if you walk into a dinner party or you walk into a store or whatever it is, it's just different. It's yeah. Different. You know, it's, it's super, the only kind of very similar experience, because again, kind of like I'm immediately positioned as a trans person the second I open my mouth, mm-hmm. which then any trans person will tell you becomes a very complicated, very dangerous situation wherever mm-hmm. you are. But when I was on the subway in New York City, my brother came to visit and, you know, my brother has, you know... Um, had some self-examination, struggled in other areas, but he's 6'10". And I had, and one of the things that we talked about was what it was like to walk on to the subway train as this like 6'10 mm-hmm. white guy. And me in the wintertime, I just look like a 6'2 tall white guy. And it is painful to see and experience the um, parting of the sea that happens like it is an actual physical privileged experience that i know my friends and certainly my wife do not experience like she's like let's go on the subway together because suddenly we just look like a straight white couple which is devastating because it erases our queerness and you know kind of does Mm -hmm. all these other things but on a personal level but it's like there is you know i think that the more we talk about these these kind of like arbitrary experiences that mean one thing in one scenario and another thing in another scenario are so useful because what they do is they tell us actually what's happening that what is happening is just another example of uh power infrastructure Mm -hmm. i and I think that more of us who come from so many different places should be particularly as we live and work in, in America. I mean, I was raised by American parents and I have a very um, complicated racist history with America. My family are white slave owners, like reparations is something I'm profoundly involved with, but it just, it's like, how do we, those of us who were raised overseas, who are here as visitors, um, what are the stories that we can bring so that our friends have some company in it? That like, you're not alone. This is, this is, happens over there. This are the solutions that we've come up with over here. These are the things that we do over here. I think that there's a lot of insight yeah. into that. You yeah, know, I think about this conversation, it's like, I'll say one thing and then you complicate it further. And then oh, do I? <laughs> which I think is maybe like a French way of talking because it's like, it's not what about ism in a way that's like really, really destructive of like, oh, what about this other thing? It's like, oh, and in this particular context, this is how this thing, like it's adding, it's adding, maybe this is me being very, very optimistic and positive about the way that um, French conversation works, but... Um, <laughs> Yeah, like, I just wanted to start one more example. Again, it was interesting, this height thing. 
you describing that made me think of a friend of mine who is a cis woman who's very, very tall. And he said to me that it's actually really uncomfortable for her when she's walking at night because she feels that as she's passing a woman, just it's crazy, like our peripheral vision, she can feel like a woman seizing up with like panic. And she doesn't know how to let this woman know that she's like not a threat as she's passing round. And like yep. her difficulty of like moving through the world being like not rapist, <laughs> you know. Yeah. Um, yeah. Yeah, like the burden that is partly privilege because for people to be afraid of you is a form of power, but it's a power you don't fucking want and like that you have to, I mean. But I think we have to talk about it because the reason that we have these experiences is because we are not white cis mm. men. Like we, un we have language for it, right? Language that they don't have because they're in it. Mm. So they, so there, you know, there is a, there's an inability to see, like if you're in it and the system was made for you and you are experiencing all the privileges of it, you don't have the ability, you have the ability to store, to tell stories that are about a bunch of other things, but you don't have the ability to tell the story about the water that you're in necessarily. It's for those of us who are Outside of the water. Again, when you look at depression rates, like levels of suicide among cis white men, like they need that language. They just don't, like it's, it's still not the case that their experiences are universal and flat. Like they need a language to understand their place in the world that goes beyond just entitlement. And yeah. because actually that's a real slap in the face. Like I know cis white men that are like just so struggling with maybe like unemployment or whatever thinking specifically of exes unfortunately here but like you know they're like like it's really really fucking hard because everything around society is telling them this is supposed to be fucking easy for you and they're struggling and again they don't have the language for that because they fully sign up to the to the fact that it is easier for them and yet it's still fucking hard yeah and, and that's hard for, i don't know i don't know well it just it keeps me you know and i think it just keeps it 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 continues to kind of reiterate this fact for me that it's like the work that you do that kind of coalesces numbers that are kind of still their acquisition is in still requires so much work right but that you then translate this into legible easily accessible digestible information is so powerful because what you've done is give the reader power right like you there is a there's a democratization or a, a kind of like an equalizing effect that happens I with your so. work i hope so it, it really is it's so true and i and i totally you know it was so interesting to hear you talk about why you hand draw your stuff because mm -hmm. you want it to be real right like you want it to be and it you know chase and i were talking about like the the realness of the trans body like as sure you know we don't have a lot of language around what it is because it doesn't fit into these binary categories but that doesn't keep it from being real something that can be drawn right mm -hmm. like something that can be um kind of uh story told and it also makes me think you know our conversation makes me think of this you know there is something to be said for this ongoing conversation between folks who use different tools to tell stories. So, right, so I use words, you use numbers and drawings. I think that because then maybe this is the additive part that you were thinking of is just like, because then we can start to see something from all angles rather than it being and, you know, and honestly, frankly, every once in a while, we just need e encouragement from each other to just yeah. be like, Mona, keep doing what you're doing. It's amazing. You know what I mean? But it's like, I think that... I agree. I don't, it's not, I, sorry, I didn't mean to cut you off. Go, no, go ahead. Yeah, yeah. I totally agree. And I think it's not even just like different things like like painting and music and, and words. It's also different disciplines. So did you see, I bet you didn't because it was just big in the UK. Um, it's really bad. I only know their um, Twitter handle. Their Twitter handle is Glamru. And I want to say his name is Amru. Their name, sorry. Um, is this fantastic, fantastic queer. Um, they do loads and loads of drag. And they're also a coder and an astrophysicist. 
and they were interviewed by Channel 4 News in the UK about this question of JK Rowling and like, you know, gender and whatever. And I'm going to just use their Twitter handle because it's really awful. I don't remember their actual name, but Glamour yeah. and Glamour. And they were just like, so as an astrophysicist, we know that particles were like, there was this test that was done where particles were fired off and they could either go through hole A or B. And very often, like, we have all these states that go through hole A and through hole B. Occasionally, the same particle is in two places at once. We still don't know how the fuck it happens, but it fucking happens. And, like, their ability to use, like, the most fundamental laws of the physical world to be like, shit is fucking complicated and so is gender was just so powerful in a way that like, again, it's not about a different medium of communication. It was their language that was just, and by the way, just again, mind blowing. The comments underneath the tweet were like, listen, I don't know anything about astrophysics, but this doesn't seem right to me. It's like, fuck off. <laughs> Work up. Like it doesn't matter how much expertise this person has, you're just like, nah, nah. Nah. But think about the anxiety, not to bring it back to Kafka, but like think about the anxiety that the trial caused and the ultimate death, right? Mm -hmm. Is it's like no one wants to tolerate, and I think that's part of what was being written about, is that mm -hmm. no one wants to tolerate that degree of unknown. Mm -hmm. That is a like phenomenally anxiety provoking experience and yeah. so so i i can understand why people would like nah 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 i mean i think but it's as unreal as being like oh yeah well so racism is a really destructive construct that can actually just be pasted upon whoever a white person decides mm -hmm. to like take over their country of or you know it's like this idea I forget what the other example is going to be but that one works just as well right like it's just it's like this none of this is as you none of this is none of this none of this makes sense like i mean we're in on this globe like propelling ourselves through space like it just it's like if you really want to get like unstable about it like think about that yeah. so it makes sense that people want to be attached to be attached to something but it makes me think of something else that relates specifically to your work is it's like you have to hold the subtlety and the complexity of that ex while using exact mm. like data while not exact or precise, but it's like it, you hold the complexity of that. Which hopefully and, then, by making it hand-drawn, I'm fucking with that notion of complexity because I'm not just gonna draw like, a man I mean again how do you represent man and woman or like any of these things with visual language that captures that complexity and maybe by like drawing these like fucking abstract characters it allows you to map onto it nuance yourself with your own mind and your own imagination rather than having like a fucking photograph of this is what a man looks like I don't know I don't fucking know yeah <sighs> I feel like we could talk all day. We totally could. Um, but, you know, I think now's a good time to stop. I'm so grateful to you for making time. I'm, like, just such a massive fan of your work, and I feel like it's so important. It's so important. The work that you do is so important. And, um, and of course, like, any excuse to, like, get down and, like, take down anything really with you is an honor and a privilege so um. i know that you have so many other things going on but um it still sucks about the job and i'm really really if there's anything that i can do to like show up for you oh but you do mona thank you no yeah it's so good to speak to you yeah really good to speak to you too and um we'll chat soon i will send you this recording which yeah, okay. I, can, I think Cool. Bye, Casey. Give my love to everyone. Yeah, I will. Sounds good. We'll talk soon. Bye, love. Bye. Bye.